The information displayed and presented here represents the view and opinion of the original creator and not necessarily the opinion of my employer or any hospital entity. The video is made for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. Content displayed is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment. This video is not meant to replace professional medical training, board certification, and standard of care practices. Viewers should be mindful that hematology and oncology is continuously changing and remain cognizant of current guidelines, standard of care therapeutics, and this video is not meant to replace or substitute such aspects of medical care. Dr. Joseph Bennett disclaims any liability to any party for direct, indirect, implied, cumulative, special, or incidental consequences or damages arising from use of the video content. Basically, not responsible if you screw up. Welcome back to another video, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about primary CNS lymphoma. A little bit of outline. Today we're going to cover the background of primary CNS lymphoma, the pretreatment evaluation, the prognostic models, acute management of urgent symptoms, induction therapy, some of the goals of therapy, and then consolidation therapy as well. Primary CNS lymphoma, this is a rare subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We define it by occurring in the brain, the spinal cord, the CSF, and the ocular regions. Historically, radiation being whole brain radiation was used, but now we have chemotherapy with high-dose methotrexate-based regimens as the mainstay of therapy. Pre-treatment evaluation, patients need a biopsy, CSF analysis, some patients may need a vitreectomy. Important to note, we can't diagnose this based on imaging alone or their response to glucocorticoids. So if patients have a CNS lesion and then get high-dose steroids and those lesions shrink, that's not diagnostic in itself. 90% of primary CNS lymphomas are CD20 positive, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The remaining 10% are T-cell lymphomas, low-grade lymphomas, and Burkitt's that's confined to the CNS. Most high-grade lymphomas have the same approach here, except for T-cell lymphomas, where no rituximab is given for the T-cell lymphomas. Whenever we see a, what is concerning for a primary CNS lymphoma, the goal is to exclude a secondary uh, CNS lymphoma, being a lymphoma that's outside of the CNS that has then had spread into the CNS area. So patients need whole body imaging to exclude a lymphoma outside of the CNS. This includes evaluation of testes for males. Primary CNS lymphoma is Ann Arbor stage 1E being extranodal disease. In terms of our laboratory workup, we need to get a CBC with differential, CMP, LDH, phosphorus, HIV, hepatitis B, and C testing. In our workup, we always need to pay special attention to the renal function as methotrexate is renally cleared and important to consider. The performance status often can be poor from the CNS disease itself, so we need to take into account that some patients may improve with antineoplastic therapy. Patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, if they have a history of severe CHF, they're at risk for pulmonary edema and pulmonary volume overload. Those patients are higher risk for methotrexate toxicity. Methotrexate accumulates in third spaces, so pleural effusions and ascites, and this delays elimination and increases toxicity. If patients have a history of CHF, then a baseline pretreatment echocardiogram should be considered. Age and performance status have been the most useful predictors for overall survival historically in primary CNS lymphoma. The International Extranodal Lymphoma Study Group has five independent predictors of poor prognosis. That includes age greater than 60 years old, ECOG performance status greater than 1, elevated serum LDH, high CSF protein, and involvement of the deep regions of the brain being the periventricular regions, the basal ganglia, the ba brain stem, and the cerebellum. This prognostic model divides patients into low, intermediate, or high risk. Memorial Sloan Kettering also has a prognostic model that divides into class 1, 2, and 3, and this is based on their performance status on the, the KPS. Primary CNS lymphoma is very chemosensitive, usually responds pretty well to chemotherapy. Some patients may have long-term durability. Uh, some select patients can receive durability and remissions of 10 years and longer. In population studies, though, prognosis is still poor, particularly in those with advanced age. Additionally, relapse and refractory disease is a much worse prognosis, unfortunately. In terms of the acute management, 
So we always want to assess the neurologic exam, any deficits. Patients can present with altered mental status, weakness, headaches, seizures, focal neurologic deficits. We need to confirm the, the diagnosis with a biopsy. And then we can give steroids, mainly being dexamethasone, which often can improve signs and symptoms. Dosing is usually somewhere between 8 to 16 milligrams of dexamethasone per day. And that can be in one or two doses per day. We gradually taper steroids at cycle two and onward. And also, as I mentioned, response to steroids is not a diagnostic modality. Patients on high-dose steroids always need to think about PCP prophylaxis, but in this case, if they're on high-dose methotrexate, then we often avoid Bactrim due to drug interactions. A little bit about methotrexate, since this is the backbone of primary CNS lymphoma therapy. The mechanism of action, this is an antifolate analog. It's active in the S phase of the cell cycle. It inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, which then inhibits purine synthesis. The distribution of, of methotrexate is distributed throughout the body, but it concentrates and distributes in third spaces, such as pleural effusions and ascites. Lots of drug interactions to be mindful of. Aspirin, penicillins, NSAIDs, these increase the plasma levels and the toxicity of methotrexate. Folic acid supplements, these counteract the anti-tumor effects of methotrexate, so they should be discontinued prior to therapy. Proton pump inhibitors, they reduce elimination of methotrexate and increase toxicity, so those should be discontinued prior to methotrexate administration as well. We always need to be cautioned in patients with renal function impairment. Um, other things, we need to stop folic acid supplements before starting. If they have third space fluids, those should be drained prior to administration, thoracentesis, paracentesis. Patients receive vigorous hydration while on high-dose methotrexate. This is often 2.5 to 3.5 liters per meter squared per day, often with sodium bicarb, 1 to 2 amps per liter of solution. We aim to get the urine pH greater than 7 at the time of infusion in order to aid in clearance. We monitor drug levels while on high-dose methotrexate. And another important fact is carbonated beverages can increase the urine pH in patients, and this can also eliminate uh, or it can impair drug elimination. Some of the side effects to be aware of, myelosuppression, the nadir is usually day 4 to 7. Most patients will recover their counts by day 14. Mucositis is seen somewhere in most patients day 3 to 6 after infusion. Acute renal failure, azotemia. We can see transaminase elevation, bilirube elevation, pneumonitis. Neurotoxicity has been reported as well with side effects of aphasia, behavioral seizures. Delayed encephalopathy is one of the more rare side effects. And methotrexate can also call, cause a radiation recall rash as well. Induction therapy. We talked about high-dose methotrexate being the backbone of therapy. In our evaluation, we want patients to have a creatinine clearance greater than 30 for methotrexate, ideally. If they have baseline renal dysfunction, we coordinate closely with our nephrology colleagues in order to optimize renal function as much as possible. High-dose methotrexate is usually given for four to six cycles. Two additional cycles can be given after maximal response, um, and we can always consider additional chemotherapy agents terms of definitions, one gram per meter squared of methotrexate is considered high dose. Hydration is crucial for renal protection, but greater than or equal to three grams per meter squared is what is thought to penetrate and re reach CSF concentrations. If patients are CD20 positive, often give rituximab, although the studies on this don't show a clear uh, benefit, but most institutions opt to give rituximab, even though the benefit isn't well defined. If patients are severely immunocompromised, we can consider omitting rituximab if their risk of infection is higher than the therapeutic benefit. So some of the induction regimens that have been studied. The MTR regimen, high-dose methotrexate, temozolomide, and rituximab for four 28-day cycles. This is the Alliance 50202 study. 
are MPV, rituximab, high-dose methotrexate, and procarbazine and vincristine for five to seven cycles, was studied at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And then in younger, more fit patients, some institutions consider more aggressive regimens. Some of those more aggressive regimens for younger fit patients include the matrix regimen, which is methotrexate, cytarabine, theotepa, and rituximab, or RMBVP, which is rituximab, methotrexate, carmustine. Uh, historically, it was tenopicide, which is no longer available, but atopicide is still uh, used commonly, and prednisolone for two 28-day cycles. Methotrexate in these regimens, hydration, as I mentioned, is very key for renal protection, 2.5 to 3.5 liters per meter squared per day. This hydration often starts 4 to 12 hours before methotrexate and continues 2 to 4 days after methotrexate administration. So some patients may be ineligible for methotrexate. These are always difficult uh, situations, but we have a few other options. We can consider temozolomide, rituximab, whole brain radiation can be a consideration, especially if their goals are palliation. Age is not a contraindication for methotrexate alone. The most important considerations are performance status and their renal function. When we assess response, an MRI brain with and without contrast usually got about every two to four cycles of methotrexate. For patients with abnormalities at baseline, they need eye examination, spinal MRI, CSF flow, and uh, cytology. The goal is to achieve a complete response, a CR, before consolidation therapy. Patients can get up to eight doses total of high-dose methotrexate prior to consolidation. If patients have persistent lesions on MRI while on therapy, some institutions consider high-dose cytarabine being 2 grams per meter squared every 12 hours for four doses. This does have considerable toxicity and limited CNS per penetration, but if they have persistent lesions and they're fit and can tolerate more aggressive therapy, we could consider dose-adjusted TEDI-R, which is timozolamide, atopicide, doxyl, dexamethasone, brutinib, and rituximab. Primary refractory disease. Uh, this is disease that persists after two or more doses of high-dose methotrexate. We can consider additional lines of chemotherapy. The International Primary CNS Lymphoma Collaborative Group has guidelines for follow-up for patients. Their guidelines include MRI with contrast every three months for two years, every six months for the next three years, then annually for five years. So a total of 10 years of surveillance imaging. They also mention in the guidelines that you can consider longer or indefinite imaging as well. Consolidation therapy. So if patients are transplant candidates, the preferred modality for consolidation is a high-dose chemotherapy autologous stem cell transplant. These are theotepa-based conditioning regimens such as TBC um, and TTBCNU. You contrast this to patients with you know, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma where the conditioning regimens are different, such as BEAM. If patients are not a candidate for autologous stem cell transplants. We can consider whole brain radiation versus maintenance therapy. Uh, some of the things that have been studied for maintenance in patients who aren't candidates for autologous stem cell are uh, maintenance lin lenalidomide. Whole brain radiation does have significant neurotoxicity, so that's always something to be mindful of that we want to limit uh, future toxicities and cognitive impairments, encephalopathy, long-term deficits, if at all possible. Patients with relapse and refractory disease, unfortunately the prognosis is poor. If they had a prolonged response to high-dose methotrexate, we can consider a re-challenge with high-dose methotrexate. The other options include abrutinib, atopicide, liposomal doxorubicin, dexamethasone, rituximab, TEDI R, as I mentioned previously, abrutinib, rituximab, and high dose methotrexate, lenalidomide and rituximab has been studied, pomalidomide and dexamethasone has been studied, as well as CAR T. So let's summarize here primary CNS lymphoma is rare, 
It's confined to the CNS, the spinal cord, the brain, the, the eyes. It's a subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Most cases are DLBCL CD20 positive. Comorbidities are important considerations, especially if they have fluid accumulations from CHF or ascites or pleural effusions. Renal clearance, important to always be mindful of. Primary CNS lymphoma responds well to chemotherapy, and some patients may have durable remissions. Induction regimens are methotrexate-based, followed by consolidation. Okay, everybody. That's it for primary CNS lymphoma. Hopefully everybody learned something and you guys enjoyed this video. Feel free to hit the subscribe button and you guys take care. We'll see you next time.